Excess Gaming Podcast Halloween Special 2015 with your host Xander Scullion and James Gruesome. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Excess Gaming Podcast. This is episode 74. We're recording this on the 25th of October. And yes, this is our annual Halloween special we have every year, and that's why it's annual. <laughs> I'm one of your hosts, Xander Scullion, and joined with me is Mr. James Gruesome. What's up, James? Greetings, everyone. Trick or treat, smell my feet. Give me something besides those orange and black peanut butter things, because those are gross and the absolute worst Halloween candy next to raisins. No thank you. Hello, everybody. Speaking of that, you know, I saw a meme the other day on Facebook where they were showing these, like, uh, you know, candy apples, but instead of using candy apples, they were using onions. Like, how fucked up would that oh, be? Oh, dude. Yeah, I've seen that before. Like, that's just, uh, I don't know, man. Like, that might be kind of funny at, like, a Halloween party for adults, but uh, it just – that's kind of brutal to, to do to kids, you know? <laughs> like, like when I see a kid, when I – like, I usually give out candy. We have a haunted house down the street from us. Uh, the guys do the yard up, like, insane. It's really awesome, and my wife usually goes and helps out down there. So me and my friend, while his kid's trick-or-treating, we sit out on the porch and drink beer and give out candy. Uh, and we usually drink the beer with a straw, you know, I just feel a little wrong about drinking beer in front of kids <laughs> trick or treating for some reason. But, uh, and I just kind of, I have like, I try to have good candy and bad candy. So like if you're too old to be trick or treating and you have like a cruddy costume, I give you bad candy. If you're too old and have a really good costume, I cut you some slack and I'll, I'll hook you up. But depending on the costumes and everything like that is kind of how I give out the candy more or less good or bad. It's always nice to have the crappy candy and the like really good stuff that you'd like to get, you know? Oh, hell yeah. And you know, what's really funny is uh Halloween is kind of, kind of special too, because that's around the, 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 the time that you and I first met each other. It was like five years ago. I remember, uh, the, you know, the band I was in at the time, you know, Rick just grim, we went to go play the rock shop in Fayetteville and that's how we met you and Liz and uh, Sharpie from the from the Villians. I mean, so whenever you know Halloween starts coming up, I always get kind of nostalgic because I think about those times as well. And man, those are those are some fun times. All the zombie walks and all that crap. Always, you know, it was very cool. Like just like through the horror rock genre and a lot of shows. Like I've met a lot of really good friends and people that I've known for years and people that are, are really good. You know, like from friends and family so that was a, a really good thing even though i don't go to quite as many shows and go out as much as i used to still the things and people i met through that are still always near you know yeah definitely now we we got a pretty interesting uh episode because um, we're going to be of course doing some halloween stuff but also this month marks the 30th anniversary the 30th birthday of the original nintendo entertainment system it's now 30 years old and I thought we would talk a little bit about a little bit about uh, the original Nintendo, like how we got introduced to that. Maybe talk about a couple of games with that, and then we'll go into the you know Halloween stuff. Talk about some horror movies, games, you know, stuff like that. But before we get into all that, uh, there is a little bit of gaming news. Not a whole lot's been going on. Uh, of course, there's a lot of freaking games coming out uh, the next three months: October, November, December. As we all know, those are like some of the biggest months. In gaming, uh, some of the biggest heavy hitters are coming out soon. As I, of course, uh, I think it's already out. Halo Five, and also uh, November, you got games like Fallout Four that's coming out. And I think been... the Halo might actually be on uh, this Monday at midnight because I, I got a actual uh, phone call from GameStop and I left a voicemail because I pre-ordered uh, WWE 2K16. And they were like, and we just wanted to let you know it's coming out on Tuesday, and you can get it at midnight, and like, since Halo's coming out. So they're having the midnight release for uh, Halo, and I guess any other game that comes out on that day, you can, you know, go start waiting in line at 9 o'clock until midnight. And that's just a really long time for me. i got to work in the morning. <laughs> yeah, they, they did something like that with um, another game. I can't remember. I think it was the, I think it was Battlefield 4 when that was coming out. 
or no, no, it was Battlefield Hardline. When that was coming out, it was the same night that Final Fantasy Type Zero was coming out, and I remember it was kind of funny because I went to GameStop because they were doing the midnight opening, and I called them. I'm like, hey, can I pick up you know Final Fantasy, even though you know everyone's up here picking up you know Battlefield, and they're like, sure, and it was so funny because you could see such a uh, selection, like it was divided. Of fans, like you could tell the people that were coming in to pick up uh, Battlefield, and you could tell the people <laughs> that were coming in to pick up Final Fantasy. But uh, yeah, I'm glad they do stuff like that. I'm glad they're not like you know, oh, this is Halo Five Night. You know, you can't get WWE. Go back home. Yeah, it's like they're cool. like, could I could I just skip everybody that's uh, getting Halo? That happened to me one time. I was getting Metallica tickets back in 1994, and uh, oh, yeah, back when with... they were good. Yeah, yeah, there was the Summer of Shit tour. Uh, it was still, you know, some people diss on them, you know, after the, with the Black album, but, hey, man, you know, I like that one, too, and uh, they were my favorite band at the time, and we went, and I went with my mom to go get tickets, you know, because I was, like, 14, so waiting in line, and it was the same time they were selling tickets for the Eagles, like, Hell Freezes Over, when they were getting back together, so the whole, dude, I swear, I was the only person in line waiting for Metallica tickets. Like, I want to say, I think at one point they came around and asked, like, is anybody here for just Metallica tickets? And I was like, yeah, me. And I think I did actually get to kind of like skip some people in line, but it was, it was a brutal line, man. They, uh, it's kind of funny, you know, there's you know, midnight releases and ticket sales for records and games, you know, it's always, it's kind of cool. And then you hit a point where you just, you know, some people like me, it's just like, oh man, I don't feel like doing that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very, I'm very selective on games that go out for midnight releases. I mean, that was just convenience because I think I had to, I think I had to work the next day. I think I was going to go out of town and I was like, man, I just want to go ahead and get Final Fantasy now. So when I get back home, I can just start playing it because I, I mean, I was really looking forward to the Final Fantasy 15 demo. That was the biggest thing. That was the biggest reason why I got Type Zero. But yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, it's going to be a lot of games coming out, man. I'm very, very stoked, and I'm like looking at my wallet. I'm like, holy shit, because I got the the Fallout 4 Pit Boy uh, special edition. I got that pre-order. That's like 120 bucks. It comes with that big ass like Pit Boy that you can wear and put your phone in. It looks, it, it's very novel and it looks cool. And of course, uh, you got some more amiibos coming that I'm, <laughs> I got pre-ordered. And uh, December, because that, that's all happening in November next month. December, of course, you have uh, Xenoblade Chronicles X that's coming out. I've been really anticipating that. And also Fatal Frame. Uh, Fatal Frame actually came out for the Wii U, I believe, this week. Yeah, uh, my my brother had texted me, and he was like, Fatal Frame's out, and I was thinking of getting it. But then I was like, I remembered the wrestling was coming out, 2K16 was coming out on Tuesday, and it's like you said, you got to check the wallet and be kind of selective, you know, and I'm probably, I'm going to go with wrestling first and see, I'm probably going to wait, you know, and check the funds and see how it goes. But there's a free demo uh, that everybody can go and at least try it out, and then you can decide. I think it's I think it's fifty bucks. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, that's the only way we're getting Fatal Frame, and I'm just glad to have gotten it. And it's it's very cool, very awesome October game. Cool, it came out this month. Yeah, and I mean, I'm gonna definitely get. The only my only concern is I know I'm gonna have to delete some stuff off my Wii U because the Wii U just has such a small amount of space and. I'm, I'm just like, man, I, I know I'm not going to be able to have enough room for that game. So I am going to download the demo and at least try that out. And then uh, I want to, I am going to end up buying it, even if I have to delete some of my you know, Smash Brothers stuff or Mario Kart stuff. I'm going to get it just because I feel like it's very important that we get Fatal Frame, that we go ahead and buy it. Even though it is only digital and I'm not a big fan of it, I believe that if we show the initiative that it's popular and people that want it, then we could get a physical release and you know, later entries could possibly be localized more to the to the Western audience. So that's that's yeah. really that's really what I'm doing. I'm doing it to support the series because I I really want the series to keep on going. We all, yeah, we all can make a difference on things like that. Like, it's good, like, especially, like, you know, that one is a little bit more of an investment. 
development. And sometimes if there's just, you know, companies you like and they come out with download games, I think, you know, if they're around 10 bucks, I'll try to get things just to support them. You know, like my Yakuza games, which Yakuza 5 coming out in November still, download only, which I think is going to be 40 bucks, which is a really sweet price. But I always tried to buy the Yakuza games new, uh, certain series and games that I really like. I just, I try to go ahead and do the new thing with those because, it, there's probably more people, you know, that have that same viewpoint like me, and enough people doing that, you know, can't really make a difference. I think it has. I mean, I, I think there's a reason why we're finally getting a lot of the Yakuza uh, or Yakuza stuff over here, and it's because it's become such a cult following, and people are finally speaking out, and it's, it's taken a couple of years. I mean, I mean, shit, it's been taken as long as we've been doing the podcast to get uh, five over here, you know? Yeah. Uh, it definitely has been out. You know, we've been going about three, I don't know if yeah. like three or four, somewhere around then. But it's it's definitely been a very very long delay. It's been out in Japan for a while. They've already had another game come out. But hey, I'm just happy to get it, and that shows. I think you know, if enough people get this one, then there's a good chance for six eventually when it comes out. The the Ishin and the Samurai era style games, I'm pretty sure we're not going to get it, but I'm happy with just the main numbers in the franchise. And, you know, especially with a, and even if we do get download only, as long as we still get it, because they're hitting that perfect price range for me. You know, 40 bucks. If you pre-order, it's 35, I believe. And I mean, that's just, I mean, that's a super sweet deal. Like, you really can't beat that. That's the price I'd love to see as much as they're going towards download only. That price point, to me, is is the right one, you know? Though yeah. I'd gladly pay 60 for this game, you're going to give it to me for 40 Like, that's... And that makes it, like, even better. And maybe a better shot that other people will try it out without having to drop, you know, that 60 bucks. Now, with that being said, and we were talking about uh, hard drive issues, um, I know they are... Coming out with a one terabyte uh, PS4 very soon, and they're also are they already have the one terabyte hard drive for the Xbox One with the Call of Duty Special Edition that comes with one terabyte hard drive. So it's nice that they are coming out with the consoles with larger hard drives because, yeah, I mean some of these games, uh, just Halo Five alone, I believe it's going to be a uh, sixty gig game. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be huge. It's just these space fillers. I mean, I would definitely, when I go for PS4, that you're saying that, like, that's one of, someone like me would definitely shoot for getting that, because I've experienced that with PS3, and at the time, I had one of the uh, the largest, I think, you know, they've gone larger since then, but at the time, about four years ago or so, I had the largest one they had out, which is over, like, 100, I think. And I've I, I've run out of room. I constantly have to delete things, and it, I don't have a whole lot of full-on games. I have a lot of smaller ones, it seems. You know, I'm, I'm really big on downloading those, but it's like those add up also, and it's it's really tough. You know, it's like picking, but it's like man, it's easy at first. Like I'll get rid of this, get rid of that, but then you you start running shallow, and it's like it's always there. You know, you can go back and re-download it, but it's just like man. I don't really want to do that. I'd rather just have a lot of room. Yeah, exactly. And also, uh, some of the biggest news that, that happened uh, last week was the um, rumors of the new Nintendo NX. Um, you know, I recently, uh, last week, made a video talking about the rumors. And the reason why I say it's rumors is because it's still nothing set in stone. Nothing uh, put out by Nintendo themselves. But there's been speculations and talk on, especially the Wall Street Journal, that said that the NX could possibly be a hybrid console. That means a console that's a handheld plus a home console. And uh, what what are your thoughts about this, James? Like having it's initially going to be what the Wii U was, what we were wanting it to be, but it's going to be actually portable and playable. You know what I'm saying? It's just going to be, uh, you know, it, it kind of falls into that area of I'm not sure because they they do so well with their handhelds only. And, you know, would this be something that's going to replace a handheld, you know, to where you, you know, they're, they're really as far as handhelds, the, you know, you go with the Vita, but they're kind of the, the only game in town, really, when it comes down to it. And it's like, are you going to force people to pay more than they normally would for only a handheld? You know, would they keep the 3DS running and they're handheld only? It's, it's so open that I, I don't really know. I, I wouldn't want to see them put all their, you know, eggs in one basket or all their 
treats and one jack-o'-lantern bag or whatever just because i'd hate to see them lose out on what they have is such a strong audience and they're handheld if they're able to keep some type of difference uh i think that could work but if, with the way it is like i'm just i'm not really sure at the moment i just need more info you know uh, yeah i'm the same that and you brought up a good point about putting all the eggs in one basket because that's what worries me the most because you know we saw you know when the wii u wasn't doing that great they had the 3DS to bounce off of. But they were going to be essentially turning two markets, the handheld and the console, into one market. So if it starts failing, it's going to be failing on both ends, if that's the case. And that, that goes in the whole, like, you know, maybe that's why Nintendo's doing some stuff with the mobile market now, you know, with cell phones. And, you know, they're doing things with cell phones like the Pokemon Go, where it's... I, I like their mobile game ideas that they're coming up with because they seem to be more like game games. They're not just like – they still have that casualness to them, but they're legit games. They're not like a, an app uh, game that's just there to make you buy more coins to keep doing this. Because, I mean, the Pokemon Go, uh, Go aspect is really cool where, you know, you can hunt Pokemon in real time using your phone and your camera. And you could, like, sit there and be in – you know, the grocery store, and you see a Pokemon come out of nowhere, and you have to go and try to catch them. That's pretty cool. And you can, like, challenge people and stuff. Yeah, I don't really think, you know, some people could be leery of Nintendo doing that, but I'm pretty sure at the end of the day, you know, they're not going to put out crap. And, and, you know, with the NX, like, they're, one of the things I would like as far as the handheld with it is kind of like what the we how you can play your game on the pad, but I would just like to be able to go further around in my house you know, yeah. I don't even have to go outside. I mean, the front porch would be kind of cool, but, uh, you know, just a, a little bit more distance, I think, would would have been really cool with, as far as the game pad and if something, you know, they could implement into the new one. There's still just, you know, it's so many questions and it's still, I'm sure, you know, a few years away. And we'll just have to get more and more info. So, you know, probably more little info and rumors will pop out, you know, month by month. And then all the little puzzle pieces will fall together at one point. Yeah, I mean, the cool thing is if it's a handheld and console, it would be great for people like myself that travel. You know, so if I'm playing a game on the weekend and I'm like, man, I really love this game, but I'm going to be going out of town for work. So I won't be able to, you know, I'm not going to take my, I, I never take my consoles with me when I go out of town. I mean, I take my laptop with me just because of, you know, doing YouTube and, and stuff like that, uploading videos and editing stuff. But I never take consoles with me. So it'd be kind of cool if I was playing like a, a Nintendo game. I really enjoyed it. I could take the handheld version of it with me on the road and continue to play it. That's that's one of the things that really attract me to the idea of a hybrid console. But like you said, man, it goes both ways. I mean, it could be either really good or really bad, or it could be like lukewarm. You know, it's it's really weird. Yeah. You could shut some people out. Yeah, there's some people. Yeah, you know, I imagine they go with the handheld, uh, even though handheld, you know, that cost a little bit, you know, more. Well, granted, they're still cheaper than some of the handhelds back in the day, like the Turbo Express. That thing was like three hundred dollars. So, their handhelds are way cheaper than that. You got to look at the people that sometimes only get handhelds, and it's that kind of you know forcing someone's hand that wants to get that handheld to spend you know an extra hundred more dollars on having to get or you know who knows how much it'll cost, but having to get this whole bundle. You know, is it something that can work separately? Does it kind of go with 3ds? Is that market still there? Are you closing it down? That it's something. I don't think they really want to risk. I mean, I have faith in them doing, you know, what I think would be the smart thing. Because I just, I know they know how well their handheld, uh, their handhelds do. And I'm pretty sure they know they wouldn't want to, you know, sever that audience and doing something that shuts them out. Exactly. So, I mean, who knows? I It's exciting. Regardless, it's really exciting hearing about this new stuff. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, other than that, uh, before we take our break, we're going to segue and talk about a, a new Kickstarter that's been coming up that I've been kind of interested in. And I, I don't know if you heard about it yet, James, but the Friday the 13th video game. I, you know, I saw some clips. I didn't uh, didn't really know if it was a Kickstarter or what. I just I, I saw it, and I was just kind of like, I don't think this is going to do very good, uh, <laughs> just in general. You know. <laughs> well, it's so far, I mean, it's, it's doing... 
it was doing really, really well when it first got announced. Um, their goal is seven hundred thousand, and they're at uh, five hundred thirteen thousand. So I mean, really? like, so they only need like two hundred thousand more to go. They have nineteen more days, but I mean, it looks really, really cool, and I like the fact that you know you could play as the counselors or you could play as Jason, and you can essentially make your own Friday the Thirteenth game. You know. It's one if, you know, if done right, I, I like that element, uh, you know, the counselors or Jason, I could picture it, you know, being a pretty good online experience if done right. Um, just, it, there's a lot of things they could do with it, you know, I, I wonder still now in this day and age, will it catch crap about playing as the killer, you know, and like Texas Chainsaw on Massacre on the Atari, like mean, <laughs> your leather face. Well, they did. This is kind of good thing that game got like banned because it was just horrible. <laughs> they did. They did get uh, Kane Hodder, the dude in motion capture for Jason. Oh, really? Yeah, that's he's... pretty cool. But yeah, I'm like reading it right here, and like someone was asking, "It's like I can be Jason Voorhees, right?" And they said, "You get to play as Jason." Let's say this again: You get to play as Jason. You get to stalk camp counselors in Crystal Lake and brutally kill in new and innovative ways, as well as some we've seen all too familiar. Grab a counselor in a chokehold, pick them up over the ground, smash their face into a tree repeatedly, or about lifting a how about lifting a counselor up above your head as they kick and scream, holding them long enough to walk a, a rack of farm spikes to slam your victim down, <laughs> you know? And, and then, of course, they mentioned they got Kane, uh, Kane Hodder, which if you some of you guys may not be uh, familiar who Kane Hodder is. He was the longest-running actor who played Jason. I mean, what did he start? He started out in, what, Jason Takes Manhattan? Is that but, where yeah, started? I think he was. Yeah, I think it, that that was uh that would have been eight. I want to say he might have actually started at seven. I can't remember for sure, but it was like seven, eight, nine. Jason goes to hell, and he was at least. I want to say in the Jason versus Freddy. I don't think he played Jason, but he was. Uh, if I remember hearing right, I think he was like Freddy's hand in that movie. Like he did a couple things in it. As far as like some stunt work, because he, you know, he was a stunt man prior to, and still, and uh, just when he'll be that random guy like in a bar that's getting in a fight, or lots of horror movies now, he makes cameos. Actually, I think in Freddy vs. Jason, he was one of the people in the neighborhood. They were asking about Freddy, and he just like opened the door and like shut it in their face. So, like yeah. a lot of people use him for little cameos and stuff, and just you know he's well loved in the in the horror community, and just seems like a, a pretty cool guy, you know. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard a lot of people that who's who's uh, met him in the past and said that he's a really nice dude. But yeah, they have a lot of horror icons involved in this, including uh, exclusive producer and cinematography Tom Savini. Wow. That, that is really, really awesome. You know, Tom Savini, uh, best known for Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead, Creep Show, Friday the 13th, Parts 1 through 4, Maniac, The Burning. Maniac. <laughs> the Burning and the Texas Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Yeah, The, and, the Burning, that, that was another, uh, for those who haven't seen it, another camp movie. And there's kind of speculation on the, when it was started getting uh, – you know, was the, the writing started on it, but it came out after Friday the 13th and Tom Savini actually passed on Friday the 13th as far as doing the effects to do the burning just because it was something different. You know, it was a different movie. It was still at camp. And if you like those killers of the camp movie, I, I highly recommend the burning. It's got the, uh, the George dude from Seinfeld. He's oh, in it. Jason as a, Alexander. Yeah. Yeah. He's wow. in it. As a, or a counselor, I'm not really sure. He always looked kind of old and bald, but uh, <laughs> he's in it. Bur Burning's great. It's kind of based on the uh, the Cropsey legend. There's a really cool documentary called Cropsey, and it really doesn't have anything to do with camp, uh, but it's more about a guy who was let out of an asylum and apparently, you know, like returned back there and hid in the woods, and there was some uh, missing special needs children in a neighborhood. And they never really – they arrested somebody, but I don't really think they were ever really sure if that was the guy that did the murders. But it's it's just called – Ropsy is about an hour and a half. It's a very, very cool and uh, kind of chilling and disturbing documentary and sometimes. Oh, nice. And uh, one thing I really like about Tom Savini is I liked his uh, 
his version, like his remake of Nine to Living Dead. I enjoyed that one a lot too. Um, very cool. They used, uh, you know, known known for the Candyman movies, Tony Todd. Oh he yeah. He played the the main role in that. You had a way stronger uh, female lead, you which know, is, in the old is, one. Which is way ahead of its time, considering that today's you know whole whole like feminism movement. I mean, it was this was back in the nineties. Yeah, yeah, early nineties. I mean, you go back to the original Night of Living Dead. You know, the chick in that was pretty hysterical. I mean, the dude had to like smack her in the face one time. That sounds <laughs> bad, but he was trying to calm her down because she was just flipping out. And uh, you know, Tony Todd. I just I love him and everything, Candyman and everything else. He's always cool. Uh, he was great as the lead in that. The chick was great. Um, just all around, I, I really enjoyed uh, that remake too. I thought he did a good job with it. Uh, he made he kept it very true to Romero's vision, but added some like little spice to it. And I remember like how disturbed I was when I first watched that movie when uh, the zombie came out of the uh, you know I think it was the first zombie that was in the graveyard and you know he just came out of the ground so like half his clothes were cut off uh behind him because he was yeah that, yeah, that was really, awesome oh my god that really disturbed me because i didn't know about that you know you know i thought when people were buried they actually had their full clothes on so i was like why is half his suit missing <laughs> and i'm like sitting there looking at this like chubby ass zombie ass shaking in front of the camera like oh, oh my god this is disturbing but <laughs> and then the one like really skinny zombie that comes out of nowhere to get shot in the head when they gets in the house you remember that one yeah Oh, that was that's such a good movie. Just, just all around good one. And, and speaking of that very first zombie, the original first zombie, Bill Hensman, uh, he was in a movie called Flesh Eater, and it also has uh, like many horror movies that has uh, you know alternate titles. I can't remember the the other one that has something like Night of the Living Dead, but Flesh Eater is one. That Bill Hensman, I want to say he. He might have directed or produced it. He had like a higher up role, and he was also a zombie uh, in the movie. And he, he passed away a year or so ago, but he was uh, another iconic guy at a lot of the horror conventions because he was the very first zombie you see in Night of the Living Dead. You know, he was kind of to some people the very first zombie. He was the one. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Well, guys, we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to be talking more about horror movie, video games, movies, and more for our Halloween special. But for now, sit back, relax, and enjoy the awesome tunes of the Casket Creatures.
Welcome back, guys. And that was some music from our good friend Ryan Cadaver, who's been on our show a couple of times. Uh, he has a little band called Big Casket Creatures. And that was uh, the song The Devil's Night, one of my favorite tunes. And actually, he, he put a, the, the band put up a new uh, music video back in August, and they used a lot of 16-bit like RPG elements called The Final Day by Aaron Romero. And that, that was really cool. Very cool. It fit in. It's like you said. It you know it looks it looks like you're playing like Final Fantasy, but you know it has it with them talking and all the guys in the band, and uh, it was just done very well. The guy Aaron Romero, he's done a few videos like that, and all the ones I've seen uh, have been very cool. But the Cast Creatures, this is their month. They play a lot. If you're down in the Georgia area, especially around near Atlanta, uh, check them out because they play a lot of shows around this time of the month. Very cool guys. And, one of my favorite bands nowadays. Yeah, definitely, definitely really cool guys. I mean, it's always a treat to have uh, to have Ryan on the show because, I mean, I remember a lot of time we all talked about Alien Isolation, and I still need to buy that game now that I have a PS4. That game's probably cheap as hell now. It's probably like 17 bucks. It's one I definitely need to play more of. You know, I, I went into it playing some of the, like, downloaded, like, Ripley missions, which are very, very hard, and... Uh, I can just kind of scoot around the main game some, but it's one I definitely just want to sit around and like play all day. It just seems like one of those games that would be great to you know do it that way. Just go into it again and uh, just very cool the bit I did play though. Yeah, and that goes into something I wanted to ask you, James. Was there any sort of game, and it doesn't have to be a horror game, but what game, like what scene or moment, actually kind of scared you a little bit? That one, I, mean, I, I can remember a long time ago talking about this one, but it's still the one that definitely stands out was the Friday the 13th game. Um, you know, when that one had come out, it's probably, you know, between 10 and 12. I don't remember sitting in a room, playing on a beanbag chair, little TV, and my friend, it had got him earlier, and he didn't tell me about it. And we're sitting there, or actually, he might have told me about it. He was like, man, it scared the crap out of me. We're sitting there. It got him again. And it got me, just that sound it would make. And I'm like, there he is. That little ding, brush, and it's like, there he is, right in front of you, <laughs> kicking your ass. Um, you know, that probably up next to some of the Marios when they'd be like the princesses in another castle. Like at the end of part three, I think, that was pretty scary. When you actually beat it and the Toad's like, no, nah, I'm just joking. She's right here. <laughs> that was pretty brutal. I you know, Speaking of Mario, one of the things that kind of scared me as a kid, and I always sound funny admitting this, but playing Super Mario World and the Ghost Castle theme, for some reason when I was a real little kid, I mean, I was like, you know, five or six years old, that music kind of scared me a little bit. It was very, I think it's because it was so atmospheric. Definitely. Just it, it had to go with it. And, you know, with Mario, too, those little masks that chase after you when you have a key in Mario oh 2. Oh, my God. Why are those so scary? They, they really are. It's like playing any of these other... Uh, there's quite a few horror games on the Wii. Uh, the Calling, that's one recently, and it you know interacts with the Wii mode where you'll hear things come out of it on the speaker. And that one, I can definitely say, uh, creeped me out. One of the older Fatal Frames. I uh, saw some at the end of a hallway. And I'm like, go down there. And I was like, I don't want to go down there. Get yeah, me neither. And like, finally we went, and there was nothing at the end of the hall. We just thought we saw something. Uh, I really enjoy a lot of the games that kind of have that creep factor or just intense. Like if something's chasing you, uh, those can be really cool. Uh, it, you know, even compared more to as as a jump scare. When they manage to get those in, I still enjoy like a decent little jump scare once in a while. But sometimes just that creep factor of what could be down there instead of something that actually is just running at you can be even more scarier. Yeah, I think the jump scares a lot of people to look at those as like a, a cheap thrill or a cheap scare. But I think a jump scare done the right way is freaking amazing. I mean, uh, the original Dead Space, uh, their jump scares were really well done. I mean, because sometimes you'll play some games and you know there's going to be a jump scare. I remember when I played uh, Until Dawn. For the PS4, that's a more recent game, and I think I think Until Dawn really helped 
the Friday the 13th Kickstarter that we were just talking about, I think that kind of helped it because it had that slasher feel to it. Do you remember hearing, I I almost want to say, like I heard rumors of something that was going to be like Friday the 13th a few years ago. And it almost seemed like it might have turned into Until Dawn. Yeah, yeah. I think it was another Friday the 13th uh, game that was going to come out at one point. Because I, I remember hearing about it, and it just dropped off face the earth. And then Until Dawn came out, and it has so much of those elements that you would see in a Friday the 13th. It's got the teenagers, and all the teenagers fit those stereotypical stereotypes. You know, you got the, the virgin, you got the jock, you got the pretty girl, you got the bitch, you got, you know, you got all these different personalities and they all get killed one by one. Of course, it, what makes this game interesting is the, uh, the butterfly effect in the sense that, you know, what decisions you make the the decides who dies and that has certain repercussions. But yeah, I mean, it's, I, I think that really helped with Friday the 13th and, uh, I'm trying to remember what I was just talking about before I said Until Dawn. I was talking about the – oh, yeah, the jump scares. You know, some of them some of them are really cheap, though. Like, um, I think a good example would be, like, uh, the Five Nights at Freddy's. You know, the first Friday, Five Nights at Freddy's, you know, it was – I can understand where people would get scared, but now they have so many of them. Like, I, it's hard for me to believe that people are still scared when they play this game because there's jump scares that happen so much. It becomes predictable. It's like, oh, I'm about to turn this corner. I know something's about to jump out at me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that along, too, with, like, the games that have the jump scares, once you get that over with, sometimes you're not going to be scared anymore because you know it's there. Whereas you have something that's a little bit more creepy, like I was talking about earlier, that can still last and hold up. I mean, you can play the creep factor away, but you know, you just don't sit there every day and play it. It, it can still be there more so than a jump scare, which is just sometimes it's a one-time thing. And like you said, done the right way, and sometimes it's worth it, you know, for that one point just just to get you to jump out your seat for a minute. Yeah, and I think uh, another game that really freaked me out, and it wasn't jump scares, it was just anxiety, was Resident Evil 4. <laughs> You know, there was so many things that happened in Resident Evil 4 that just pushed my anxiety level because, you know, I, I remember there was like a stage or part in the game where you're on these carts, like these like mine carts, and all the people are sitting there jumping from cart to cart trying to get you. And then there's like the chain, two chainsaw guys come at you on both ends. And the chainsaw guys were, I mean, people talk about nemesis, but the chainsaw guys just really, really freaked me out because they were just on that mission. And once you'd hear that chainsaw, you knew that you were battling a horde of, you know, these cult parasite infested villagers. But somewhere there was someone with a chainsaw chasing after you. It was, it was really fun. That's why it's probably one of the best, you know, Resident Evils that ever came out since Resident Evil 2. Yeah, this is always held up a, you know, going back to Resident Evil 1, I just remember the front door, you know, that oh, was always yeah. a, a pretty good jump scare the first time you try to do that. And then, of course, the, you know, the dogs, the, the dogs coming after you was definitely a, a bit more in that kind of anxiety ridden uh, scariness as they just would break out. And just every time I hated dogs chasing me in that game. It's like it just always bugged me out. I hated the crows. I really hated the crows because the target system was really bad in that game, so it was hard to kill them. It would be best to use the knife, but still, like if you were like a millisecond too soon, they would start pecking your eyes out. And I, I remember there was so many times I would die from the actual crows in that game. It's like zombies, okay. Hunters, oh shit. Crows, holy fuck. <laughs> no, yeah, and when you think about it, it's like the crows and the dogs... Like, those are things in real life that could really come and attack you. Yeah. I don't know if that has something to do with it, too. You know, to dogs? Who hasn't been chased by a dog before? You know, yeah. bird. I had one come down and try to attack me. Damn mockingbird one time. The backyard, I turn around, it's like right in my face. I, you know, I had the same thing happen to me one time. I was, I remember I was walking, I was walking somewhere and I had my headphones on. I was listening to music and I remember I saw like this bird out of the corner of my eye, like fly really close and I was like, whoa. So then I, like, I turned down my music a little bit, and I started hearing him, like, you know, making it like, ha, ha, sound, you know. And then I looked, and he was, like, chasing me. 
And I'm like, what the hell? And it was because I guess I got too close to like a bird's nest that was nearby that I didn't know about. But this bird was just like, holy shit, get the fuck away from my kid. Damn. You know? it's, it's probably a mockingbird too, man. They're just, those things are rotten, man. I went back in the yard with like a shovel. Like I was, <laughs> was ready for it. If it was going to come at me again, it was like, man, this is my yard too. Like, can't we get along? They're not, they're not as bad as blue jays though. Blue jays, like, if you, if you, for some reason, accidentally kill, like, a, a baby blue jay, and the only reason why I say it is because I had a dog, and, and she killed uh, some blue jay babies that fell out of the nest, and that blue jay carried a grudge for her for, like, a year straight. That blue jay would always come down and, like, hit her in the back of the head when she'd go drink water outside or something. It was like, it never forgot. <laughs> Man. So don't piss just... off a blue jay. Not them. Yeah, I think you're right. Those two. Blue Jays and Mockingbirds, man, they're two of the worst. Like, especially if you get near the nest. Even though it's way up in a tree, and, like, we're not going to get to it, it's still just in their area. So they just decide, like, hey, you're in my space. (laughs) Packing your eyes out. Yeah, and, you know, there's so many – it's so funny when you sit back and you think about it. Because I was thinking about this when I was – before we did the episode about how much, you know, the horror genre really – is a part of video games and it's been a part of it for such a long time. And I think it's because of fear being such a common human emotion. I mean, I was thinking about some of the games, like even, you know, games like berserk being chased by that freaking smiley face was scary. It's just, there's always, you know, been elements in the games and, you know, going back when you can see, you know, whether it's your Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street just kind of had that cult following. And I mean, it was kind of cool those games came out. But, you know, even in, in those have been around, you know, since the Atari age, as far as Halloween and Chainsaw Massacre, like we said earlier, that those have been around. And it's just always been, you know, and even some of the earlier games, as much as they could, uh, probably could portray things in music a little bit better than graphics sometimes, uh, which just it has that mood. You know, music is a big part of it. Yeah, think about the music in the original Clock Tower. Like when Billy was after you, the guy with the, the scissor guy. Scissor man. Yeah, the freaking music that they would play was like, it had that heartbeat sound and it was just very distorted and it just, it really was freaky. And I mean, someone chasing you with a big pair of scissors is scary enough, you know? <laughs> That's one. I mean, Clock Tower just... You know, the, the scissor man chasing was always, you know, just kind of creepy. And, and going back to even the, uh, you said then whether you play the PlayStation version or the, the Super uh, Famicom version, uh, that one too. Though he looked a little more clunky chasing you, and they had the point and click kind of action. Which the thing with point and click, if you're trying to get away from something, it's even a little tougher because you're not controlling the person. You know, you have to rely on your mouse or controller to, you know, the movement of the little uh, reticule to, to get the people to move. And it still can be, you know, very stressful. I mean, Clock Tower was, uh, those two first ones were just really cool games that I imagine some people, you know, m- might have missed out on, but still really cool to go back and play, uh, you know, kind of starting with Alone in the Dark. Oh, yeah. Which that one, I did. Didn't, I'd like to go back and play that one. I remember messing with it a little bit on one of the computers at school. But that was one of the main ones you know, that kind of really kicked off that boost as far as the mid-90s. Yeah, it really did. I mean, you had you had the the basic elements that really helped push you know Resident Evil out was Alone in the Dark and Famicom Sweet Home. You know, which was also, uh, Sweet Home was also put up by Capcom, and uh, for some of you guys who, had, who are listening that's never played it, um, of course you can you can get a repro card of it and play on your NES, or you can uh, download the ROM, English translated, but it was like an RPG, but it had th- these like horror elements, and I was thinking, I'm like, man, why hasn't this came out to like the virtual console now, you know, but... I think a lot of the reasons is probably because of license because it was actually a television show in Japan. Uh, so that's probably why it hasn't came over here yet. But that was yeah, a really good could, game. could be a licensing. Uh, lots of times with those older games, sometimes it had uh, a lot to do with religious imagery. 
yeah. that halted a lot. But it's, it is really cool. It's like you said, you have the party system and each of your characters, you know, has a certain thing they can do, whether it's unlock doors, you know, maybe one has a weapon, one has a candle and there's permadeath in it. So if one of your guys in your party dies, you, you know, you're screwed. Like if your door opener, you know, is gone. And, and that's in a sense where like the Resident Evil loading door screen came from. You would go up to a door in Sweet Home and the door would appear open, you know, would appear and kind of open and you'd go through. Um, very cool. It's one, you know, I've played a little bit here and there. I really wish I'd played it as a kid. Um, there's a lot of games like that when I just had a little bit more patience uh, as far as figuring things out. Uh, but very cool. You know, it's one I remember playing and I was writing down, you know, certain clues that you would find just, just so I would remember. But I, I think it's especially for its historical purpose or, you know, if you'd like RPGs and horror, it's definitely one that's worth going back and checking it out. And there's been some really cool repro cards I've seen that have like blood splatter on them. Uh, a lot of the people do a really cool job. You know, they kind of go all out. You know, they might have like a glow in the dark cart or whether it's painted with blood or, you know, bright orange. I, I think, uh, that little bit of extra I really like, you know, cause you're, you're going in to buy something that you could just download, but you'd like to get a cart. So I like it when they go the little extra mile and just make it cooler looking, you know? It's definitely a reproduction card I want to have in my collection. I'll eventually get it. Uh, at some point, I, I, my favorite one, of course, is the blood splatter. I, I love the cartridge that has the blood splatter on it. This looks awesome. It, it's such a great cover, too. The person screaming, and you see, like, the mansion, which was, you know, also uh, Resident Evil very was, was very much influenced by that with being inside the big mansion, like in Sweet Home, you know. And, uh, of course, you know, you had some other games on the NES, that had some horror elements to it, like even uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, which I, I think was actually a good game. A lot of people trying to like say Nightmare on Elm Street sucked. I, I thought it was fun. It was uh, it was more enjoyable. I played one time with my nephews because that was a four player game, which even if you had like a bad game, sometimes that multiplayer element just really helped. Uh, at least you had a friend that could suffer through it with you, you know. And with that one having four players, which we didn't have a lot of four-player games. Mostly they were sports titles. So I thought that that was something really different. And we played it with uh, three players. And it was, you know, we had a good time playing it. Um, it's always a walk through and, you know, find a little bright house, go into Nightmare World. Um, one of those that it's not, it's like you said, it's not as bad as a lot of people make it out to be. You know, like we like Friday the 13th. And yeah. Diamond Street, that one's pretty cool. Jaws, I'm still not quite sold on that one after all these years, but it, it's one of those things, you know. I think you know with the inter, with the internet popularity and social media, it's kind of like people now, you know, they they see Nightmare on Elm Street, they've seen videos of people being like, "This game's a bunch of donkey shits," you know, and they're like, "Oh, this game sucks." I'm like, dude, totally, just try it out. Just try it out. Leave all the opinions out and. If you've never played it, definitely play it. Another uh, really fun NES game that I really enjoyed that had a lot of horror elements to it that was another point-and-click game that was put out by LucasArts was Maniac Mansion. You know, I was just I'm glad you brought that one up because I was thinking of that earlier, huh. and, uh, I, and it slipped my mind. That was another one that really creeped me out in a sense as far as when you'd see the other room and one of those green or blue dudes – you know, they just be like waiting around the corner. You're in a room trying to find something. Like, you know, they're going to come in there any minute. Um, just a really, just a really weird game. And, uh, very cool that that one had come out. I actually got that one recently. I bought some games from a friend of mine and that was one of the ones I picked up. Uh, so I like, I didn't have it in my collection. And I was like, man, this, this would be a cool one. And that whole point and click thing, you know, really came over as far as, you know, a lot of people played Shadowgate and Deja Vu, but there was the third one that I didn't even play as a kid. Uh, it took me, you know, till I had a whole bunch of, like, emulators before I finally played The Uninvited. Oh, yeah. It's actually also, too, the most expensive one of those, you know, three games. It's still up there in price, but if you if you like uh, Shadowgate and Deja Vu and that kind of just point and click and exploring the place, it's just like those. Except it's pretty much big. There's ghosts and, and monsters where Shadowgate's a little bit more on like the Dungeons and Dragons level 
I think, as far as like wizards and magic, yeah. this one goes into the full on, you know, ghosts and monsters and just uh, another really, really cool one. Yeah, and speaking of sequels, uh, May Ant Mansion did get a sequel called uh, Return, uh, I believe it was called Return the Purple Tentacle. Day and of the Tentacle. Day of the Tentacle. That's yep. what it was. But it's it's not as good as the original. The original had that creep factor. This one's a little more lighthearted because I think it was more based off of the the television show they were trying to make. They tried to make like a live action television show to me. That Mansion. was weird. I remember yeah. that. It probably came on like the Family Channel. It was yeah. some some weird channel. This weird show that didn't really have anything to do. I guess it was just a bunch of like weird people I, I remember trying to watch it and i was looking that up not too long ago trying to find some info on it you know it, it only ran like one season uh just in going back to the first one you know uh, a moment of controversy with that one which was removed for the nintendo version i'm sure along with a couple of other things was the putting the hamster in the microwave because no, it no. was originally a pc game and, and it was on there now the ham the hamster in the microwave it, it is in the NES version, but there's some of them that they took it out. Like, I actually have the uh, the version that you put the hamster in the microwave, and that really freaked really? me out. Yeah, that really freaked me out. I'm like, did I just – I just did that. I, I really just did that. And, like, they – and it had the blood and everything. I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, I mean, that was that was something that was crazy. And, and like, Sweet Home, that game had um, – it didn't have permadeath, but, like, each character had their own unique um, abilities. And if they got captured, they would be in there, and you'd have to pick another person. So, like, the way one person would beat the game would be different than another person would beat the game. Yeah, it was a really, really fun game. I, I really wish they'd do something more with, you know, Maniac Mansion. Bring it back in some shape or form. That one, yeah, that would be a, a, a cool one to see again. I think a lot of people uh, would be into that because it's just uh, – yeah, that one might – I can't remember if that one or Shadowgate was like the first point-and-click game I had because those that some people I imagine were like off-putting and they probably didn't give the games a chance. But there was a, a lot of just really cool things in those games. And, you know, if I played Shadowgate first, which I love so much, that probably definitely opened me up to be able to play some of these other ones. Uh, Tombs and Treasures Oh yeah, is one I found recently. You know, not done by the same people, but still very similar. And it has a RPG-ness to it, because it has an overworld as you go to the different tombs and areas. And then you go into more of the first-person style, like you're kind of used to with Shadow Game. Yeah, Just, and the, you know... Yeah, I was going to say, if uh, you guys were listening and you want to hear a really good review of Tombs and Treasures, actually, uh, Rob Man from Happy Console Gamer did a full review of that game. Oh, really? Yeah. I'll have to check that out. That one's one. I, you know, a lot of people, I think, like I said, I missed out on that one until just, you know, a couple years ago. That was a good game. And, of course, I mean, you had games like uh, The Goonies 2, which was a lot of fun. If you want to go into, like, the little bit of a... Uh, it wasn't really that much of a horror game, but, you know, the Goonies had some scary spots in the actual movie. I remember I was kind of freaked out by the dead body. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Konami Man was always kind of scary, too, in those games. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, that, that was that was something fun. And, of course, you know, you had the whole survival horror genre that really sprouted. And we've, we've talked about that in, in, in past episodes. You know, we talked about, you know... Resident Evil, but of course, you know, Dreamcast had some really great survival horror games, including um, uh, Ill Bleed. I loved Ill Bleed. Ill Bleed was one that was, uh, it did, you know, it was kind of, you know, different Go, going into your, it was kind of like a theme park with uh, horror movie elements. And, you know, the, you pick your ride that you want to go into and just very you know bloody with death but but comical too it was one that was it was very fun you had your heartbeat meter yeah i guess it's someone for you have a heart attack and finally die because you're scared to death and uh i was telling you and i was gonna try to play it before the show but i didn't get a chance to but there's a, a ring game like the movie the ring there's a ring game on dreamcast 
It just kind of seems in that survival horror element also. I don't know if it's based on one of the sequels. I think it's called, like, Ring of the Terror. So it may have to do with one of the movies. I'm not, you know, completely sure on that. But uh, House of the Dead, you know, that was just another, uh, yeah. as far as when you go with the fun, you know, you want a great light gun game. Even now, whether it's on the Wii or you go back to Dreamcast, House of the Dead is, is tough to beat. Yeah. Just multiplayer, multiplayer goodness on that one. And of course, if you want to play a game that's just as scary as it is, is to control play a uh, Blue Stinger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's a great Christmas game, too. It is. It is it's a great Halloween and Christmas game, Blue Stinger. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll mention a couple more that we can talk about before we get into uh, games we've been playing recently. And that is, uh, you know, Eternal Darkness for the GameCube. That game really freaked me out because that game had that insanity meter that would actually act like your game was glitching. And I remember it made me think that I, my memory card wasn't working anymore. It, it legit, like, I legit thought my memory card was fucked up. Yeah, you'd think you'd have a bug, you know, like a fly or something crawling across your TV, and it's just in the game. You might go through a door and pop out the other side, like, playing as the enemy. Uh, it, just very unique, very awesome. You know, it's it, it's hard to find people that have played that game and didn't love it. Uh, anybody that had a great, you know, GameCube exclusive too. That anytime you see it, it's a, it's a great one to pick up. You know, it's a little bit. Usually, it's around like thirty bucks, but it's definitely worth it. Uh, it still plays good. You know, you go through different areas of time, and you get to play as different people, and it just it has just a lot of stuff to it. And they did a really really good job with that. And you keep hearing rumors of a follow up to it, but. They always just kind of stay rumors. Yeah, they had um, they had a very big influence with H.P. Lovecraft as well. So, I mean, if you guys are into Lovecraft, then definitely check out Eternal Darkness because it has that whole like Cthulhuism and you know stuff like that. I mean, I remember the Cthulhu games on the Xbox were a lot of fun too. They were like almost like mystery games. See. Yeah, there's one of those I'd heard about that uh, was recommended, kind of reading about uh, Eternal Darkness. There was one, uh, Cthulhu something, and it had like a subtitle. And I've seen it like online, and it usually goes for about 40 bucks. I just didn't really want to drop the money on that one just yet. So I always keep an eye out for it. You know, if I just saw it in a store, I'd probably be more apt to buy it, even if it was a higher price than having to bother ordering it. But it kind of had like a, I want to say a little bit of like an insanity meter on it as well from what I've read. It just it sounded really cool. It was more of a first person game, but it looked really, just really awesome. Uh, and if you want to go back to like the 16-bit era too, a few of those real quick. Uh, Splatterhouse was one that Oh yeah. everybody loved. Loves. You know, whether it's the TurboGrafx-16 version, the arcade, uh, the Genesis, you know, for 2 and 3, with 3 being just a bit more of a, a beat-em-up. And then uh, Nosferatu, that's one I oh, yeah. still always recommend on the Super NES. If you like Castlevania and Prince of Persia, this is probably a game made for you. You know, it has those elegant jumps, and, you know, you have to hang and drop down, so it plays like Prince of Persia, but... It feels like you're in Castlevania with the big monsters, and you just get to go up and punch them in the face, and because it's your starting weapon. Yeah, that was a. I, you know, I actually played that game not too long ago because I was like debating if I was going to do a let's play of it. I was like, I want to play some Nosferatu. Yeah, that I think that'd be a cool one because I just imagine that's one a, a lot of people missed out on, uh, and it. It's a, it's a rather expensive cart now. I happened to get it when it was still... I'm actually 20, and I was kind of like, eh, do I want to get this? I'm like, eh, it's Nosferatu. And it just sounds too cool. Like, I have to get it. And it's like a $50 cart now. So I imagine that could push away a lot of people, too. So definitely, if you get an emulator of that, you don't want to spend 50 bucks. try it out, because it's a really, really cool one. Yeah, definitely. And uh, before we go into games we've been playing recently... Just to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Nintendo Entertainment Center uh, system, uh, I'm going to ask you, James, what is one of your favorite NES games that you just really enjoy that you feel like is the epitome 
of the Nintendo? Well, picking one that I mean, uh, you know, if, if you just want to, if you like, I would have to go with like Super Mario Brothers three, uh, just for the first one that pops in my head of just thinking like, you know, some of like the most fun, just like wow, you know, like it's just it's such a step up from you know as far as like play. I mean, I always love the graphics in Mario two, but just the whole style of it, the the flying, it had all the classic Mario elements, which you, you can't help but relate Mario to, you know, being like synonymous with Nintendo. And like part three was just, there's so much hype, you know, whether it was Nintendo Power or whether it was the Wizard movie, which is pretty much a commercial, you know, for Nintendo and for Mario, because that was the big reveal. That was what a lot of people, you know, you wanted to see it anyway, but it's like, oh, I can see you know, a clip of Mario 3, because it wasn't a commercial, there wasn't demos or, you know, online or anything like that. And then you finally get the game, and, you know, that that was at a time when lots of times, you know, I mean, it was just everything you wanted in a game. It was just, the, you know, it was so perfect that they ended up putting it as a, uh, a boxed-in game, you know, with the system. I remember you saying you got your first Nintendo with Mario 3. Yep. And just what a, man, what an awesome packing game. And just, you know, when it comes down to Nintendo, like, that one's just it, you know. One of, one of the greatest games on there. Yeah, definitely. I, that's probably the same one I would pick as well. I mean, it, it's like bottlenecking with the original Mario Brothers with uh, Duck Hunt. But Super Mario Brothers 3, that, I mean, that was the first Nintendo game I had as well. And, you know, at the time, uh, you know, I, I had a you know, Nintendo for the first time, and it came with Mario 3, and I, I didn't understand why my neighbors wanted to borrow Mario 3 so bad. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I didn't know why. It was because it was such a, a, a big new title, and it was so big. And, uh, yeah, that's, I mean, it revolutionized video games. Nintendo did. I mean, uh, I know this is more of a Halloween episode, so we didn't want to get too much into, like, Nintendo talk, but I definitely just wanted to have that little segment to celebrate 30 years, because, I mean... That's that's phenomenal. But it's been a great been a great thirty years for them, you know. We we really still is. play our Nintendos to this day. Still exactly. buy games for it, you know. Who would have thought? Exactly. So we're gonna be going into games we've been playing recently. And uh, James, what you what have you been playing? <laughs> I've played a few things. Uh, I picked up a few new Game Boy games the other day, and uh, some of the ones that I, I don't remember, they were pretty bad. Some like bad sports titles that were like 50 cent. Uh, but I did get a Looney Tunes game called Marvin's... Uh, what is it? Marvin Strikes Back or something like that. Marvin's Revenge. But it's based on Marvin the Martian. Nice. You get to play as him, and honestly, most Looney Tunes games are not that great, the ones I've played. Uh, me and my brother were we're talking about those, and we came to the conclusion that the uh, Space Race it was probably the best Looney Tunes game, and it's just you know it's like Bugs Bunny Cart. That's what it is. If you're flying around, uh, that was probably the best one. But this Marvin game, I actually really enjoyed it. Uh, you start off, it's kind of an overhead view, uh, and you know you, you get your dog, and then you get some other characters like the dog can jump. So you have to switch back and forth, you know, if there's certain areas. Because I saw these platforms, and I was like, how do I even get over there? I'm like, this is just weird. And I get the dog, and it's like, dog jumps. But it's kind of a go around the level and collect parts to your ship. And then you start off. But I think you're going to, you know, kill uh, Bugs and Daffy and all them. I think that's the plan. But just it was a Game Boy Color. Just it was really good uh, from what I played so far. And then... I also got a new Barbie game. Oh, nice! Barbie and the Magic of Pegasus. Um, it's oh actually my made. God. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's actually made by Way Forward. I found out. You know, we love them. Uh, graphics are great. It's pretty simple. I know it sounds terrible, but you know what? I found I like Barbie games on Game Boy Color, and this was a Game Boy Advance game. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna try it out. It's a dollar, and uh, I really had a blast. It's got some puzzle elements. You have to uh, free all the people that have been turned to stone in each area. And then 
uh, you get new magic wand powers that give you jump abilities and, uh, you know, you can fly across big gaps. Uh, you get on the Pegasus once in a while and you fly around and collect coins, but she doesn't really seem that magical. Um, but at the end of it, I, I enjoyed it. I actually sat and played that game for quite a while. And, um, I also recently got a brand new system. Oh, I got did, the, yeah. the, the classic. Everybody loves the 3DO. I'm sure everybody had one of those when they were a kid because it was so affordable. $800. <laughs> uh, I remember seeing the display unit for those with Gex. And just even as a kid, you look at the price, you're like 800 Like, I'm never going to get that. So you don't even really look at it because in case it is good, you don't want to tease yourself with it. But yeah. um, a buddy of mine was selling one. And I was like, oh, I was like, I want the 3DO. And we'd been talking about it for probably over a year because he oh, yeah. did uh, a lot of his stuff was still in storage. And you know, he had to get it, you know, he wanted to make sure it worked and everything first, of course, and try to get everything together. And I went ahead and got it. And it came with three games, uh, Corpse Killer. That's a good Halloween game. It's also on the Sega CD. But it's one of those uh, FMV, very cheesy Horrible looking zombies. Uh, it's pretty bad, but it's still kind of fun at the same time. Um, I also got Total Eclipse, uh, which I believe that was a, some type of flying game. I didn't play it the most. And then Slayer. Slayer is actually a, a Dungeons and Dragons game as first person. And it was pretty cool. Uh, I played that one for a bit. I've kind of been in the process of uh, trying to figure out how to burn games for it because it will play copied games. Uh, I hear there's some issues between the systems because a couple different companies made 3DOs. It was the Panasonic, there was the Gold Star, and I believe another one. But I have the original Panasonic one, which I hear has no issues playing the games because some of the ones you know i want to play they're a little bit more pricey and it's just something i don't want to i'd like to get a few games for it but it's something i don't want to spend a whole whole lot of money on uh i like the controller it the controller really feels like a mix between super nas and genesis because it's it's a little larger the original controller that comes with it and it's got you know three buttons you it's A, B, C, or one, two, three, something like that. Then you got your two shoulder buttons. So you got five. So it's actually a little less. You know, you figure for this disc system, you know, Super NES has got six buttons. Genesis has bumped up to a six button. You think they would have went ahead and went with six too, but they're like, nope, gonna do five. But it has a good feel to it. I, I do actually, I think the controllers are really nice. And then I have a second controller. Which it's um you know it's a name 3DO brand but it's smaller. I guess the second ones if you bought them as add-ons were you know a little bit different, same feel but just smaller. Uh, I like the larger one a little bit better. And a weird thing with the 3DO is the controllers actually plug into the controller for the yeah. second player. Yeah, the yeah, daisy chain. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't have a port, so that's it's just kind of weird, but. The original controller does actually have a uh, headphone jack and a, a volume control on it. Oh, wow. Which, yeah, you don't see that a whole lot. And I, I like little functions like that with controllers. I, I have an NES controller that actually has a headphone jack on it, too. And, uh, it's just kind of interesting to see those. But, you know, 3DO, it was not the most successful system. But uh, I, I'm kind of glad just to have one because, you know, we like collecting systems, and it's just a... Uh, just an odd one, you know, like, I've got 3DO, and people are like, why do you even have that? <laughs> I don't really know. It was just pretty cool, but, uh, I've been playing those, and, uh, I've been playing some WWE 2K15, gearing up for the, the new one coming out on Tuesday, which is supposed to have, you know, the largest roster ever. I've seen some clips, a list of the people that's on it, and, uh, it is, it's a pretty insane list, and it's, Featuring Stone Cold, all the Stone Cold fans out there, you get to play through the storyline and the, the life and legacy of Mr. Austin. So definitely looking forward to that. And then uh, that's a bit about the – oh, wait. And also, I mean, last episode I mentioned I've got uh, two Famicom multi-carts. had 400 and 200 games on them. 
and I've been messing around with those, and uh, definitely worth the 25 bucks. You know, I paid 25 for both of them. Uh, there's a lot of Famicom games that uh, I've never played. Um, some are, some have, tra- and I think a lot, some don't have translations. Some do. Some might just be, might have had English anyway. Uh, just I found some really cool ones on there. It, the cards are funny. They're yellow, and one of them has Resident Evil on the cover, and the other one has Devil May Cry. I I don't really know why, but it actually has 400 you know legit games. It doesn't have a level of Contra as one game. The second level is another one. It's 400. Some of them are kind of they seem like cell phone games, you know. So there there are some newer ones on there, but on the 400 cart, maybe like a hundred games you know, take up of those, and the the rest are actual games, but I figure for the price for that many, it's just something fun I'm gonna mess around with for a while, you know, I'm gonna make notes of certain titles that I, uh, really liked playing on there, but it, it was worth it, I picked it up on Amazon, uh, so it's, it's definitely cool for anyone that wants a whole bunch of games in one, you know, affordable little bundle. And that's about the most of what I've played lately. How about yourself? Well, I was going to ask you, James, how do you play uh, your Famicom games? I have, um, it's called, it was called Generation Next. Oh, yeah. And it plays Famicom and uh, NES games. And my brother gave it to me. The He said when he got it, he got it for pretty cheap because the guy, I told him the NES board was like fried. So it only plays... Uh, Famicom games. So that's pretty much what I use at the moment. It works fine. I really like the controllers that came with it. Um, it kind of looks like a, a little short, stubby dog bone. So they're like a, a little smaller, but it's still got a good feel. It's kind of rounded off, and it, it kind of looks like an NES pad with the colors, the black and gray. And uh, you have two, it's got four buttons on it. Uh, I think two of them might be like turbos, and then it's just got your B and A. But uh, I actually I'll use that controller with my uh, NES sometimes. That that's how much I actually it's just a, a nice good feeling controller because it's a little smaller than I normally like, but it just it, it's got a good feel. And uh, I've got quite a few, you know, I've got maybe fifteen Famicom games and. It's played them all, you know, just fine. So if you ever see a a Generation Next for cheap and anyone is just looking for something to play, you know, NES and Famicom, like, it's it's definitely a good one since I've I've used it, so. Nice, nice. Now, uh, myself, um, I've been playing a couple of stuff. Um, Before we started recording, I actually played uh, Doom, the alpha, the alpha version. How is Uh, that? It's it's really fun. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't do any gameplay footage of it because uh, I was gonna like do a, like a let's play, maybe like stream it online or something. But the problem was is it was a closed alpha, so if you stream it and it and the thing is the game constantly shows your gamer tag. So it's like, uh, like a screensaver. It's always showing your gamer tag. So if you were to upload it and it's and if anyone sees your gamer tag, you would actually be banned from playing the beta version that's going to come out later. So I was just like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to chance it. I'm just going to you know play it. And I played it a little bit. It was fun. It was Doom. It was you know, it made me think of Halo mixed with. Uh, Team Fortress. It was very fast paced, very sci fi horn ish, you know. You'd have, you know, people that could summon demons and chase you down and stuff like that. It, it was fun. I really liked it. So I, I played a little bit of that. Also, uh, Dragon Quest Heroes. Uh, I played a little bit of that last week. I need to play some more now. But Did that come I, out or is it still in demo? I, no, it came out. I got the, uh, I got the special edition. Of it, and it came with like a big treasure chest, and came with like a slime and DLC and stuff like that. It came out, uh, I think last last week. It came out, and I've been playing that. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, it's you know, it's a lot like Hyrule Warriors. If you guys enjoyed Hyrule Warriors, you'll enjoy this because it's like the same thing but with Dragon Quest characters, but it's got a little bit more depth. It's got a little bit more of. Uh, replayability to it than Hyrule Warriors did, which Hyrule Warriors had a lot of replay value to it, but this one has a little bit more, but it still has that arcade like, beat-em-up, you know, action-packedness feel that I like, and, uh, 
I played and beat Yoshi's Woolly World. I actually beat that on stream, and uh, that man, that game was so much fun. It had so much charm to it. I would say Yoshi's Woolly World is right up there with Yoshi's Island uh, on Super Nintendo. I think it's the best Yoshi game since the one on Super Nintendo. It's so good. I, I, but it looks really cool too. Yeah, it's got the 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 soundtrack's so ha- like happy and bouncy, and then you got like you know the 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 graphics. You know everything's made of yarn. Everything's made of crafts. Even the the way they did the water, it's like someone took a, a blue backdrop to make the water and took like little white pieces of yarn to make like the waves and stuff like that. It's, it's really really unique. I, I really like that. I really liked it. So. I Did you get the gigantic Yoshi? I not yet. I pre-ordered him actually from Germany <laughs> because he's going to be only exclusive for Toys R Us, and that comes out uh, next month. And I'm like, you know what? I'll pay an extra ten dollars and just have it shipped to my house from Germany. I'm not going to go to Toys R Us and try to fight the crowds or you know fight the scalpers. So just screw that. Yeah, you never know how to. The store only ones are going to go, so it's might as well just not even worth wasting the trip. You know, if something new you definitely want, you might as well go ahead and make sure you get it. Exactly. Did those come in alternate colors, or were they just like? Yeah, I mean the green. The, yeah, the big Yoshi was is only green. Um, then they got the three little ones, and I got those already: the pink, the blue, and the green ones. And you know, you can use the amiibos on Yoshi's Woolly World, and it doesn't change like the ability of your Yoshi. But it gives him his own like little skin. Like I, I put like Duck Hunt Dog. So like he had like a Duck Hunt Dog skin. He looked like a little Yoshi dog running around. It was kind of cool. That's cool, yeah. Yes, yeah, so, I mean it, it was fun. It was really fun. I also got the uh, the new Chibi Robo uh, Zap a uh, Zip Lash that came out for the 3DS. But I haven't played that yet. But I'll be first to admit that I bought that mainly for the amiibo. Because that was the only way to get that. Because I, I did love Chibi Robo on the GameCube. And I also got a brand new GameCube. I finally got another GameCube. I got a black oh, really? one. I got a black one. I went to uh, Game Giant and, you know, uh, Jeff, the owner, really, really nice guy. I, I straight up told him, like, dude, I don't I don't need the hookups. I don't need a controller. I just need a console because mine died, you know, two months ago. And he was like, well, we normally sell, you know, our GameCubes. You know, for 45 he was like, but since you just want the GameCube, I'll sell it to you for 25 I'm like, sold. So, yeah, yeah that, ain't, that ain't bad. No, it was really cool. And I got. Well, all... I kind of wish I had. I was saying I'd found one one time that was, uh, I think it was like, it was 15 or 20 and it was, it was just the cube. And I was like, man, like, I got controllers. Like, and it uses a lot of the same hookups as other systems. And, like, I, I really wish I had snagged that one up, but I didn't. So yeah, and I also bought a reproduction cart there as well, the the Fireman, which I, I love that game so much. I played it on emulators for the longest time. It was only released in Japan, so it's a Super Famicom uh, game. But I got the reproduction at Game Giant for like uh, thirty bucks, and it's you know it's in a, its own Super Nintendo cartridge. They have their own label on there. I mean, it looks legit. Uh, the guys that made this card are based out of West Virginia and they're called uh, the Repro Bros. And uh, they did a great job. So, yeah, that's pretty much what I've been playing. I've been playing a whole lot. And, I mean, I've been doing a lot of live streaming. So if you guys are listening and you guys uh, want to check out some Let's Plays on uh, YouTube, check out uh, youtube.com slash Scullion on my channel. I've been doing a lot of live gameplay for, for various games, from Mario Maker to Yoshi's Woolly World. I actually got some component cables for my original Xbox, so I can actually put that through to Elgato. And I'm, I believe uh, Devin and I are going to do a, uh, a Let's Play of Shaolin Monks, the Mortal Kombat game. We're going to do a Let's Play of that very soon. So that's going to be Very cool. Fun. That's a great co-op game. So, But yeah, guys... Uh, other than that, be sure to check out youtube.com slash Xander Scullion for uh, just the different kinds of YouTube content that I put out. And if you guys are listening to Excess Game Podcast on YouTube right now, be sure to check us out as well on iTunes and be sure to leave us a little rating and review. It really helps the show, helps more people find our show. And also on Podomatic.com as well, depending on which medium you guys are listening to the show. And uh, quick plug. As well, uh, Lords of Thunder podcast. Be sure to check them out on thefinalbosses.com. 
That is the podcast featuring Johnny Millennium and Alpha Mega Sin. Uh, very, very fun podcast. I've been uh, the producer, the audio engineer for that, and uh, their last episode was actually on action movies, which was really cool. It's awesome to hear them talk about Bloodsport and old Jackie Chan movies and stuff. It's really, really cool. Well, Bloodsport is great. I, I'm going to throw out a little plug, too, just for two Facebook pages that I've uh, been enjoying and, and kind of go along with the, the weirdness of Halloween. But uh, one page is called Strange Carolinas. Ooh. And it's just, you know, very cool for putting up just a lot of the, the weird and wonderful th- oddities we just have along the, the way, you know, whether it's weird signs or buildings. And then another page is called Did You See That? And he has a, the guy that runs this page, he's based out around the coast and he has a couple books out also that have chronicled a, a lot of the things just around, I think in North and South Carolina. But just, yeah, Strange Carolinas and Did You See That? Just two really cool pages. Uh, you don't get blowed up from them, you know, with 10,000 things every day. Uh, it's just, you know, nice, really cool things. I enjoyed flipping through the pictures and some of the things I recognized. And some are like, ah, oh, man, I got to check that out if I'm ever in that area. But just, you know, really cool, just weird things in our state. Oh, I had to check that out myself. That sounds kind of cool. And spirit. Yeah, I think you'd like them. And spe- cool. Speaking of group pages, be sure to check out the Access Game Podcast group page on Facebook for more updates on our content on either the podcast or YouTube channel. And I've also started a new little segment in the group as well called uh, Access Gaming uh, Podcast Group Talk on YouTube where I ask the, the group a question, rather it be like, you know, what's your opinions on reproduction cards or how has gaming changed from then to now in your opinion you know i'd ask them a question they they answer it and then i make a video uh of that and also throw in my two cents it's kind of a community thing and uh the first episode has went really well a lot of people have really been enjoying it they've been asking for episode two which is already recorded i actually have that on youtube as unlisted i'll be making that public uh sometime later on this week but anyway guys uh from me to James, to everybody, I want to say happy Halloween, and as always, happy gaming. Have a pleasant evening, everybody. Can't get enough of Excess Gaming Podcast? Be sure to check out the audio podcast on podomatic.com or you can also subscribe to us on iTunes. Also, if you have a YouTube channel or podcast you like to share, be sure to check out the Excess Gaming Podcast Facebook group page and join our community. All the links are below, and as always, guys, thank you so much for all your support.